really you could go out there if you want to and put together a detergent and brand it as Beyond Clean. Put it out there. There's very little regulation about what you do with the product, how you construct the label. And the only thing you cannot say is that it kills or inactivates any organisms. Beyond Clean offers a creative look into the inner workings of a healthcare industry committed to getting it right every instrument, every time. Join us every week as we explore the hidden world of one of the most important aspects of safe surgical care. And now your hosts, Michael Matthews, Hank Balch, and Justin Poulin. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Peggy Spitzer, clinical educator and technical support at Sertal International. Peggy is a Colorado native with over 30 years of combined experience as a healthcare provider and educator, holding degrees as a licensed dental hygienist with bachelor's and master's degrees in adult education. She provides education programs across the U.S. to sterile processing and APIC chapters, focusing on helping clinicians use cleaning chemicals safely and effectively. She is proud to promote education and certification in central sterile processing. Peggy is a past president, past secretary, and current treasurer of the Rocky Mountain Central Sterile Chapter in Denver, Colorado, and also provides consulting to healthcare facilities and universities for chemical management and best practices for instrument processing. Hank and Mike, we really haven't done an episode yet that talks much about detergent. I know dilution is something we've talked about and rinsing is something that we've kind of touched on in a few recent episodes, but now we're really going to get into the details around regulation and even passing items through the pass-through windows and some common challenges for that process. How do we maintain safety and compliance? So this is going to be a great episode and we've got part two next week as well, which which, again, is going to be just an enormous amount of information for our listeners. Yeah, I mean, there are a few things that are as ubiquitous to sterile processing as enzymatic cleaners and detergents. You know, they're everywhere, and everybody's got one. I'm really looking forward to the opportunity of asking, why is it that literally everybody has their own enzymatic cleaner, and can we make our own? I'm looking forward to the answer to that question, too, Mike. And as Justin reference, the frontline technician in me has always asked the question, how do we think about that hand-washing stage? What happens after something is leaving my sink, but it's not going into the washer, it's going through that window to my compatriot on the other side? What is the proper process? How do we think about cleaning and disinfecting in that context? Key questions that a lot of folks are asking today. Hopefully, we can get some good answers. All right, before we get into the interview, just a reminder of how you can find us on social media. On Twitter, we're at Beyond Clean Info, Facebook.com slash Beyond Clean Podcast, and LinkedIn.com slash Company slash Beyond Clean. Also, if you've got a recommendation for a future topic or guest on the show, or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, send an email to info at beyondclean.net. To look at those pictures, find us on Instagram. Instagram, Beyond Clean Podcast. We'll be right back with Peggy Spitzer, clinical educator and technical support at Sertal International. Joining us now is Peggy Spitzer, clinical educator and technical support at Sertal International. Peggy, welcome to Beyond Clean. Well, I'm very happy to join you this evening. Why don't you talk a little bit about what Sertal International does and what you do for the company as well? Uh, thank you. So I work uh, for Sertal International. I've been with them for 15 years, and I organize and present education both within the company to employees and also to uh, medical and dental groups that may need to have programs and presentations. And lately, I've been focusing primarily on central sterile chapter groups throughout the country. So I present education primarily uh, in my area of interest and expertise, which is on chemicals and the types of activities that go on with chemicals in sterile processing. Excellent, Peggy. So if you look at kind of the industry right now, it seems like just about everybody has their own detergent enzymatic out there. I mean, just about everybody has got one. 
who is it that oversees the quality of these products and what is the likelihood that we can get a beyond clean detergent on the market by next year? That is a very good question and it is a very complicated question. It seems so simple. The short answer would be that uh, it would be very relatively easy for you to put together a beyond clean brand name detergent in relatively short order because there is almost no regulation of detergents for medical use. There is almost no regulation in the U.S. of detergents that are used for medical applications. Uh, This is quite a surprise to most people I talk to. And I will say it again. There is basically no regulation in the U.S. for detergents that are used in medical settings. The FDA considers detergents that are used for medical instruments as class one devices, which are basically unregulated. So really, you could go out there if you want to and put together a detergent and brand it as Beyond Clean and uh, put it out there. Uh, There's very little regulation about what you do with the product, uh, how you construct the label. And the only thing you cannot say is you cannot say that it kills or inactivates any organisms. So you cannot say that it's antibacterial or that it uh, destroys viruses or bacteria because if you make any kill claims, then that product has to be regulated uh, either by the EPA for low and intermediate level disinfectants or it's regulated by the FDA for high level disinfectants. But again, uh, I'll just say this one more time, medical detergents, detergents used for medical instruments, are not regulated in the U.S. There, there is no requirement on the label. So that being the case then, you know, if there's nothing keeping me from, you know, bottling a, a magic bottle of Dawn dish soap in my own spit and calling it a medical grade instrument detergent, how is it? that sterile processing managers or whoever the decision makers are, are supposed to verify that their product is a good quality product? That's also a very good question. And when people understand that detergents are unregulated, this does put uh, more responsibility on the person who runs the sterile processing department and everybody really in the department who works with the various types of chemicals to understand what these chemicals should be doing and how to make sure that the product is actually working for the department and for the purpose uh, of that application. So if it is a detergent and, for example, it's being used in the sinks for manual cleaning, is the product working effectively at the uh, dilution that's marked on the label? And then how will someone in the sterile processing department even know that the product is working. And up till now, it, uh, I think, has been a guessing game for a lot of departments, and many folks rely on a somewhat old but uh, good standard that uh, if they are not smelling blood on the instruments, they're assuming that the items are coming clean. They may look visually occasionally and see that soils are being removed, but they don't really have a good benchmark or a good scientific process for determining the process of cleaning. And now I do believe that there are products and processes becoming available so that folks can actually have some uh, more accurate process for identifying cleaning. Peggy, it's so funny because I know Mike was joking when he said about Dawn Dish Detergent, but I actually, I want to say it's been five years now, but went into a department and they had not only Dawn Dish dish Detergent, but they also had Clorox in the department to clean the instruments, which I think was just shocking at the time. But then I went to another customer and I swear they had an IFU, I want to say it was for a breast implant, that had Dawn dish detergent in its IFU. And, you know, you just talked about no regulation, but how often have you walked into a department or done education and asked the crowd, do you guys still use Dawn dish detergent or do you have these products in your department? Or how many times have you gone and worked with a customer and educating them and found those products in their department today? 
We do find a variety of what I would call household chemicals in uh, sterile processing departments. And keeping in mind that technically household cleaning products are not illegal to use, and and in fact, there may be some suitable applications uh, based on certain types of equipment and even just things like sinks or countertops or that sort of thing that a department may need to have household types of products. But where I think the unfortunate lack of understanding for the central sterile technician and their managers is not understanding what is the effect of the chemicals on the items that they're cleaning and disinfecting. Do the staff and the managers understand the difference between cleaning and disinfecting? And does the department in general have a clear sense of the process as they get the instrumentation and take it through a decontamination from cleaning through rinsing and final terminal sterilization? The chemicals are treated somewhat interchangeably, and unfortunately, the instructions for use produced by the various devices also treat the two words, cleaning and disinfection, interchangeably. And this is where I think a great deal of confusion has occurred to the point where people are really, (laughs) they think they know what they're saying. But I have seen this repeatedly in different uh, events and asking people questions or people asking me questions. They will ask, well, how do you clean this breast sizer when in fact they're actually at the point of disinfection and they're trying to follow the directions as to using a high-level disinfectant. And so they're not, they're not cleaning it at that point. They're disinfecting it. So it's no wonder that the technicians in the central sterile department are confused about what product am I using, what step am I actually doing. They're getting so much confusion from these IFUs that they are now being told to follow religiously, and the IFUs are confusing. And to answer your original question, yes, I have seen and I've had audiences tell me, but I have seen uh, firsthand departments with Dawn or Dawn dishwashing liquid or bleach, et cetera, et cetera, underneath the sinks <laughs> usually or sometimes out on the countertop. And yes, there have been devices in the past, including certain brands of endoscopes, that specified the use of Dawn dishwashing liquid to clean the scope. And I just think this is so irresponsible but I believe at one point that product was cited as a cleaning aid specifically for uh, certain types of Olestra oily fats, artificial fats that were out there in various types of snack foods. Two things. Um, in your conversation and the confusion between cleaning and disinfecting, I'll just say that the phrase beyond clean has a much better ring to it than beyond disinfection. (laughs) I don't think the podcast would have went very (laughs) far if we would have chose that one. But, you know, secondly, going back to our idea, you know, and it is a joke in terms of tongue in cheek for the detergent, but if we were to come out with our own beyond clean detergent, or let's just take, you know, some of the real detergents on the market. I know we alluded to this earlier on. How, can and how should these departments be verifying these items are clean? I know you talked about if you can't smell blood or obviously if you can't see blood, there's an assumption there that something's working. But is there more that folks can and should be doing at that step of verification? Absolutely. Uh, There should be a whole variety of things that the departments can be doing to verify cleaning. So there are several... uh, different types of devices and materials that are used for cleaning verification. And the first and foremost is visual verification, and that's not outmoded. Take a look and actually see that uh, soil is being removed, and particularly from some of the more difficult areas, including the jointed areas, making sure occasionally that the tech is actually looking to see that the various surfaces are being removed. So the visual mode is so uh, very applicable. And then beyond that, uh, the department has to decide, are we doing a consistent cleaning or cleaning check of every item, every load, every tray, or are they going to take samples of certain items, occasionally pulling items out 
and doing random checking. And for myself, I'm a fan of a variety of different cleaning process verifications. One method is doing the ATP wand test. So this is the test that checks for the adenosine triphosphate residue. ATP is a substance that is found in all living cells. And it's not a complete cleaning test, but it uh, doesn't detect viruses, for example. But uh, it does pick up a lot of residue of certain soils that came from living cells. So these swabbing of the surface after a cleaning process, but before it goes through the washer, might be an interesting interim test. Or doing the ATP swabbing on certain items after they've come out of the washer. Now, of course, the ATP testing itself does leave residue, so then the items do have to be recleaned. And that's where maybe a sampling would be helpful as opposed to trying to do it on everything. Uh, That's not really very effective. But I think that would be a minimum type of thing. Then there are some other types of tests that are really not tests for cleaning. They're tests more for chemical level uh, efficacy. That is, there is enough chemical present. There are certain tests certain types of tests, such as a pinnacle test for enzyme content. Those could be used either on certain occasions or on a regular basis to check for the enzyme content. For Let's say, for example, an ultrasonic tank, making sure that the dosing is consistent, that the enzyme activity is there. And then another test is the tests that are used to check the actual process of the cleaning equipment. So there's a sonication test that's put out, and then there's also, of course, uh, wash checks and TOSI tests, those various types of coupon materials that are actually put in the washer to verify that there's sufficient chemistry and sufficient impingement to actually clean the coupons and therefore show that the washer is at least a certain minimum level of activity. Peggy, I think a lot of times when we when we think about testing these you know these detergents out, the assumption is we're working with all stainless steel instruments. But you know, as surgical technology advances, that is becoming less and less the case. Uh, you know, obviously, stainless steel is still a significant number, but there's a lot of other materials that are uh, you know coming to the front lines on a regular basis. Can you talk a little bit about material compatibility as it pertains to detergents? Yes, material compatibility is really a very complex issue when it comes to chemicals. And oftentimes when I'm doing a program or a, let's say, a sterile chapter group, I do try to explain that there's the department may be using a variety of different types of chemicals. And, of course, we'll tend to think of the cleaning chemicals, um, basically the detergents, as having an impact on materials. But sterile processing departments, both on the decontam dirty side and on the assembly side, also use various types of disinfectants, whether they're liquids or wipes. And the disinfecting chemicals also may have an impact on these various materials. And yes, you're correct. The many types of devices now are so complex. They have mixed metals, various types of metals, plus there's plastic components, there's ocular um, glass components, various types of O-rings and gaskets and fittings, very complicated devices. And all those components also have to fit together smoothly and consistently for the device to even function. So they're very vulnerable to various types of chemicals that can cause problems. Earlier, you had talked about bleach. Bleach is actually a a really amazing and very inexpensive chemical, and it certainly has a lot of very good applications, but it uh, can cause a lot of mischief because it's incompatible with many types of materials, um, of course, metals. But there are other types of materials that uh, bleach will be very corrosive and cause a problem. So in the zeal to clean and kill, the bleach is causing a lot of problems with that particular process. So material compatibility is the ability to use a chemical on a particular device or surface and not cause any damage or changes to that particular surface or device so that it remains functional 
and it is in a good condition for the next patient. That's the essence of material compatibility. Peggy, one of the biggest questions that comes out of that material compatibility issue, and this is especially poignant, I guess, for frontline staff on the clean side as well as back in in the decontamination area, is what do we do with these hand wash items that, as Mike says, you know, typically the ones that are not routed through the automatic washer are the ones with this different material. It's not the stainless steel item. It's the batteries or the cords or or the Doppler probes. Is there an answer, or I guess maybe better ways to phrase this, is what is the challenge with trying to send something out to the clean side that is actually clean and or disinfected? Um, you know, what should folks be considering as they confront that challenge? That is a very good question and one that when I speak to a chapter group in particular, I really try to encourage participation of the rank and file, the regular tech who frequently will come up to me and say, thank you for that program, I'm just a regular tech. And I'll say, no, no, you are, you are so important because you are the person, the regular technician is the person who actually holds those devices in their hands. They're the ones that really see what's going on. They're the ones that actually know that in that department, use of that particular chemical or process is causing some kind of issue with that particular device. They see the material incompatibility, the material damage firsthand. So while we certainly, you know, we want to make sure that our uh, sterile processing managers um, are on top of things and that they know what to do. It is the frontline rank and file technicians who actually see some of these problems occurring on a daily basis. So when they sometimes say, well, I don't really need to know about the chemicals, I'll say, no, you are the most important person who needs to know about the chemicals or to report on what may be happening. So the issue is, does the department and the manager understand the process that they're trying to achieve. That is, is the item clean or does it still still have soil on it? And therefore, are they using the right chemical for that particular step? Are they using a chemical that will indeed clean and further that that chemical will not cause damage to the device? And at first I thought was not um, was not that difficult of a concept. But it is, in fact, extremely complicated because it involves chemicals, it involves the device, it involves the device IFU instructions for use, and then involves human intervention, human activity to apply those various chemicals and to understand what process they're they're actually trying to achieve. And I, I think the best way to do this is to give you a concrete example. So you mentioned earlier about the cords and batteries which are a very common item that will go through the pass-through window. And the very first thing that most department managers will look for is they'll look for the device instructions for use. So an engineer somewhere has sat down and written up an instruction for cleaning these cords and batteries. This engineer is typically not familiar with hospital central sterile processing. They'll put things in the instructions like, Clean the cord with alcohol. I have seen this phrase so many times, clean the cords with alcohol. This is what an engineer will think. And anybody who has had some experience with chemicals and sterile processing will know that alcohol does not clean. So uh, if the cords are still uh, soiled and someone sees maybe there's still a little blood on it and they're trying to follow the instructions for use, if they use alcohol, Alcohol will uh, probably kill some germs that are on that cord, but they will cause the blood to fixate and denature and actually stick harder to the cord, like dried egg. So it does not accomplish the process of cleaning. And it was the cleaning that needed to be done before that item leaves the um, decontamination site. And it may also need uh, disinfection as well that that comes after cleaning. Well, and that brings up an interesting question. If we're looking at the IFUs and they say, 
use an enzymatic cleaner, but they don't mention anything about disinfectants, and we hand wash the item and hand it through to the clean side, is that item safe to go over to the clean side if it has been washed with a detergent and rinsed off rather than washed with a detergent, rinsed off, and then disinfected? That is an uh, excellent scenario. And that is, in fact, exactly the question that I get at almost every presentation that I give on chemicals. And this is a perfect storm between a technician who's doing the best they can, who actually has the device in their hands, the device manufacturer who's, you know, trying to put out instructions uh, for that device to the best of their knowledge will not damage it. The device manufacturer is worried about damage. The technician in the sterile processing department is worried about both cleaning and then making it safe to go through the window. And that is the problem. That is the dilemma that occurs is what really needs to happen at that window. So the the chemicals that need to be selected, for example, the enzyme detergent, that is a very safe and very compatible type of product to put on something that needs to be cleaned first and probably had some soil on it. And the reason enzyme detergents are frequently selected is because they're neutral pH. They're very gentle. But just cleaning it is not enough because now you're going to put it through the window. So this brings up a whole other ethical dilemma that, in my opinion, needs research. And that is, what are we doing on the assembly side of our sterile processing departments? Because the Long-standing rule has been in sterile, in sterile processing assembly is to not wear gloves. And when I go to help or do consulting with surgery centers that do not have washers, I tell them to wear gloves on the assembly side because they do not have disinfecting washers. They don't have washers with thermal disinfection. And this is an opinion of mine. It's not backed up by any research that assembly areas of hospitals should probably be having technicians wearing gloves because we can't guarantee that the pass-through window processes will always completely disinfect a particular item. You know, that's so important. I just have to jump in on that, Peggy, because I know people don't require gloves in prep and pack, but I've always thought that for the same reason is that the stuff coming through the pass-through window isn't necessarily going through the same process. I, I'm sure that statistically we don't really have anything that substantiates that, and maybe there are people that are confused about, well, that's an increased cost. But in my opinion, I've always wondered why no gloves in prep and pack. Hank, I'll let you jump in on the next question, but I just wanted to reinforce, I, I couldn't agree more on that. Peggy's right. That is a big um I don't know if it's a debate, but it's a big conversation right now in the industry, and it's a little confusion on the side of Joint Commission. I've heard of folks getting cited either for not wearing gloves or questioned for wearing gloves. And so the terms of the science and the research behind it, you know, just like what you were saying, Peggy, there needs to be a fair bit of attention given to that and some clarity given because in the industry, in the trenches, as you said, there's folks that are trying to do what they feel most comfortable with. And I've seen folks even in departments where the manager says, if you want to wear gloves, you can. And if you don't want to wear gloves, you don't have to. Well, what kind of message then does that send? It's just increasing that confusion. So I want to pitch out the basics uh, for a sterile processing leader or frontline technician to start in their reconciliation of IFUs because, as you've mentioned a couple of times now, uh, just because something comes with an IFU does not mean it's a clear IFU. And then you have one IFU that may not be the clearest. Just say that it's the device IFU and you're comparing that to the chemical IFU that you're also comparing to the equipment IFU. And then the question becomes, how do I put all these together and have something that's actually compliant? So I guess the question to you is, how would you start that process? Um, that is another good question, how to start a process. I would back up probably just one step and encourage uh, sterile processing department managers to conduct a chemical audit of their departments. I think chemicals reside in the background 
it's very busy and complex environment. There is so much to pay attention to that I think chemicals kind of get shoved to the back, sometimes literally <laughs> shoved underneath the sink. A, a department really needs to have a good chemical audit. Find out what is actually being used in the washers. Find out what is actually being used at the window. Find out what is actually being used in various pieces of equipment. Many departments would probably say, oh, well, we know what we're using. But I have found time and again when I have gone into departments who told me, oh, yes, we have enzyme detergents hooked up to our washers. Or, oh, I know we're using a neutral detergent. And we'd go back in the chemical room, and lo and behold, they had a very alkaline detergent hooked up, and they didn't realize it. And that was against the instructions for use, the IFU, for many of their devices that were going through that washer. Or they didn't realize that they didn't have any enzyme hooked up at all in that particular washer, and they swore up and down that, that they were using that. So a complete chemical audit is in order. Uh, the department needs to find out what is actually being used. And sometimes certain products have a way of drifting into a department, and the managers just don't realize that certain things have drifted in there so that there are maybe even two or three different brands of some particular thing being used. So get a, get a handle on that. Get an audit done of the department so that folks really do understand what they're using. I think the next step of it is also very complicated, but it must be done. And that is for sterile processing department managers to get a complete listing of the true dosing that's actually being done on every machine, every type of application, to have a true audit of the actual dosing. Some of the devices are automated dosing equipment. Uh, this is great. This is wonderful, all this automation. But those things also go drift out of their standard over time. The squeeze tubing gets worn out. Devices and fittings might not work after a while. The tubing gets pinched. They don't even realize that they're not getting the product through the dosing apparatus. So a really good chemical audit will find out what they're using, how they're dosing it, how they really are dosing it, and then using those various cleaning verification tools, find out that things are actually working, that they're actually getting some cleaning action using these various tools. That has to happen first before, or at least in conjunction with, rounding up uh, the device IFU instructions because what if the device IFU says that they should be using a certain type of product or a certain pH of product? That would be a whole other discussion that we might have about what pH is. But in essence, that's when you're talking about something being neutral or being alkaline. Then the manager needs to find out, well, how do I find out where the pH is stated for any particular product? And that would be on their safety data sheet in Section 9. They need to go there and they can look and see what the pH is for that particular product and then reconcile that with the IFU for their major devices that they have going through that piece of cleaning equipment. So it's, a, it's definitely a, a group effort doing the chemical audit, matching that up with the device IFUs. It's a major, major project. It would be something that would take place over probably weeks or months, but it it really does start with that chemical audit and finding out what they're actually using in that department. Peggy, really good stuff here in part one and very excited to have you back for part two next week. Some really great stuff in there, Hank and Mike, especially about regulations for detergent. I didn't realize it was so loose. And then the whole conversation around gloves and prep and pack, I kind of say it runs parallel to the whole brushes on the clean side conversation. And we had that discussion with Lindsay Brown from Key Surgical several months back. But I think that one's a little bit more clear cut, whereas the gloves is a little bit more of a gray area. Either way, a great interview in part one. Can't wait to talk to Peggy for part two next week. Well, you know, Justin, the original thought 
was that Beyond Clean detergent, and I was taking notes as Peggy was referencing that in this interview. But now I've got an idea for Beyond Clean gloves. Why not tap into the entire workflow of the process from dirty to supposedly clean, and we can also start marketing some gloves. But on the serious side of things, it is a confusing and, as you referenced, unregulated world out there. I've seen folks call it the Wild West of cleaning still. You know, Hopefully folks can walk away today from this interview with a little more direction, if not all the answers, at least some good perspective on what the true challenges and dangers are out there to just assume if it's in your department, it must be working correctly. Guys, as we do more and more of these episodes, uh, there are certain recurring themes that just seem to keep popping up and popping up and popping up. And one of those that popped up again here was the need for further research for a lot of the things that we just assume. We assume that the instruments coming over to the clean side are disinfected when that may not always be the case or we just assume that it's safe for our technicians to handle uh, and that's not necessarily the case there's a lot of room for some research to be done on some of these topics and i really wish that somebody out there would really take that challenge on that's a great point mike and there's so many opportunities i feel like we could just based on some of the interviews we had i feel like we could start five new businesses none of which any of us has time for but there are so many opportunities for improvement out there that's going to do it for this week's show as a reminder you can help support us by subscribing to beyond clean on itunes and stitcher we'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page just send an email to info at beyondclean.net on behalf of Hank, Mike and myself thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean